Well, I explained to the CBC, I said, listen, just because somebody's name is shit, if there was a news broadcast and, and you know, you're interviewing somebody and you're supering the name, you wouldn't super their name because that's what it is. And eventually they said, okay, 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 that's, we get it. That's what it's called. American Pie. Well, we'll just tell your mother that, uh, that uh, we ate it all. Yeah, the script was a very, very raunchy script. I mean, it, it, we know what the movie is, but reading it on paper, it was out there, and I didn't really, I, you know, I was up for the father, and I, I, I didn't like the way the part was written. I said no, and my manager at the time was just saying, well, you know, you're the only adult in the movie, you gotta think of, I said, yeah, but I, why would I wanna be in a movie I wouldn't go and see? Well, why don't you just take a meeting? Just take a meeting. You know, I met the uh, Paul and Chris Whites and realized it almost instantaneously how smart these guys were and what a great sense of comedy they had. So on the one hand, I felt, wow, this is a project that's in better hands than I thought it would be, but I still have a problem with the part. And they said, what do you want to change? I said, everything. I just don't like it. They said, okay, so why don't you come in, spend an afternoon with Jason. We'll go through all the scenes and we'll just improvise. And everything started to feel better. At the end of it all, they said, well, what do you think now? I said, yeah, okay. I said, I, I like the direction of this. I'm in. Look at the expression on her face. You see that? See what she's doing? She's kind of looking right into your eyes saying, hey, big boy. Hey, how you doing? The scene with the magazine, the scene in the hallway, looking at the family portrait, that was all uh, improvised. And it was working so well that the part actually expanded. They would give me more scenes to do. It, it turned out really well. Oh, Jim. Dad. Hi, I was just uh, looking at the old family's portrait out here. Well, that was a fun day, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Jim, I want to talk about masturbation. There were four theatrical features, uh, American Pie, and the others were kind of straight to video, not with the cast. At the time, I was, uh, you know, uh, feeling a little bit like a whore, maybe, and I, uh, you know, I would just, I couldn't, you know, turn down the money for a couple of a couple of scenes in a straight to video kind of thing. But I kind of figured that the true American Pie fans would not be buying a straight to video thing. It would be a whole different. It would actually be a younger group of kids that this would now be their movie. That's what it was. It all seemed to work for the franchise. National Lampoon's Vacation. I'm just as upset as you are, believe me. Davenport! Get Mr. Griswold's car back and bring it back here! It was directed by Harold Ramis. Well, Harold's a Second City guy, right, out of Second City, Chicago. And when we started SCTV in, in 1976, he was part of the show. He was on the show working with us. He was our mentor, kind of. We worked with him for about a, a year and a half on the show, almost two years on the show, in a writing and performing capacity. And then he went on and worked on uh, Animal House. This was his first movie directing. And, and he tended to go back to his Second City people for casting, you know, certainly SCTV people. He cast me, cast John Candy. I do remember shooting that scene. It was, it was August in Glendale. It was about 118 in the shade. Now, I owe it to myself to tell you, Mr. Griswold, that if you're thinking of taking the tribe cross country, this is the automobile you should be using, the Wagon Queen family truckster. You think you hate it now, but wait till you drive it. A fun scene to do, and Harold was on set laughing, and I, I figured things were working. Shit's Creek. I read about you guys and everything you've gone through. It sounds super crappy. Super crappy. The idea really was was quite a simple idea. There was the, these television shows, the Kardashians, the Osbournes, the you know, where you're seeing a very wealthy family and what's going on inside the home. What would happen if this was a show about one of these families, but the money was gone? We went through different incarnations in the beginning of what this family was, and eventually it ended up with the family, you know, as it was, Johnny, Moira, and the two kids. And we spent a lot of time fleshing out the characters to the point where Daniel was ready, can we move on already, he would say. <laughs> can we move on? 
with the story. I said, well, we can't. How can we move on? We, we have to know who these people are. So we did. And he eventually later on said, I'm, gl you know, I'm glad we stuck with it because everything was laid out in these characters. I mean, you know, the idea that Alexis had a, uh, a show, kind of an, an online show called A Little Bit Alexis, that was in the outline of her character. So that, you know, that was always kind of, you know, hanging in. I'm a little bit of la, 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 la. A little bit of Alexis. La, 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 la. Oh, a little wow. bit of Alexis. Okay. Yes. La, 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 la. Wonderful. We had uh, kind of pitched the show to just about every network in the United States and didn't, didn't really get a bite. And it was the uh, Canadian Broadcasting Corporation that, uh, that uh, loved the idea for the show and gave us a shot at it. But it was always called Schitt's Creek. And, and at some point, yes, the, the CBC came to us and said, now let's talk about the title. And we said, well, that's the title. Schitt's Creek is the family, that's their name. And you can look at any phone book, and you're going to look under S's, and at some point you're going to see shit, S-C-H-I-T-T. -T. That's the name. Well, you did such a great job, sweetheart. I don't know how you do it. Oh, someone has to hold it together. There's a time and place for sentimentality, and your only son's wedding day is hardly the moment. The final episode is an all-time favorite. I mean, we, we honestly couldn't get through the day without sobbing. It was just, you know, because it was the end of the series, but it was also the culmination of, you know, six years of hard work and, you know, working with this great group of people. I loved all the scenes we did as a family. Those were always my favorite scenes, the family scenes in the motel. Your mother and I have been talking and we've come to the realization that we've not been very good parents. Sadly, and most of the time, we have no interest in what's going on with you. We have no idea what's, because she means no idea. The hardest I ever laughed on the show was working with Chris Elliott, with the golf lesson that he gives me or I give him. I just, I could not get through it. I was laughing so hard. Are you using the Vardon grip? I am using La Vardon. Are you watching this, TV? <sighs> Yeah, it was just a little hard to understand, so I want a record of it. Okay, delete that, Can please. Can I get a copy of that? It was beautifully cast. Annie Murphy, just, just unbelievable. The work my son Daniel did on the show, and my daughter Sarah. Everything we'd hoped for in the beginning about having the audience involved with the show, with the characters, actually came true. The plumbing is shot to hell in this place, and we are getting out. We're getting out. What are you wearing? What is that, a nightgown? It's a nightshirt, David, and that's not the issue. The issue is the brown sludge in my bed. He has definitely left me in his dust. He's such a great writer. He has developed as a writer, his acting, producing skills, and now his directing skills. Good grief, his movie is just, well, honestly, I, and I know I'm a dad talking about my son, but it's one of the most beautiful movies. My daughter Sarah is going into her third season on her show, Surreal Estate, a really great show. I'm thrilled to death that they, you know, that they're both in this business. I never pushed them into it. It, it wasn't intended to happen. They naturally fell into it, and I uh, you know, couldn't be prouder of them, and I couldn't be happier. Waiting for Guffman. I feel a... Bri a you're blowing in my ear. Okay, all right, but you see, you jumped to a conclusion. Oh, I'm see, what I'm asking for is, your first feeling was not that I was blowing on you. It was more like Virgin Isles, or Bahamanian, oh. or Arubian. Yes. The idea of working on a script with somebody I didn't really know that well was kind of off-putting, but the idea of working with Chris Guest was very exciting. So I said yes, and we started work. The plan for Guffman was always an improvised movie, and this was, this was uh, uh, you know, Chris uh, coming off. This is Spinal Tap, which was like uh, 10, 12 years prior. That was a movie where an outline was written, but all the dialogue was improvised, and that's what Chris wanted to do with Guffman, same kind of style. In those outlines, we write the story, and we put enough information in every scene so that the story's always moving along, because if it's a big free-for-all, an improvisational free-for-all with no 
form at all could be kind of sluggish in terms of, you know, keep keeping that story moving. That's what we did, dropped pertinent pieces of information that characters had to come out with. How they come out with it is up to them. People ask me, were you, uh, you know, were you, were, you must have been the class clown. And I say, uh, no, I wasn't. But I sat beside the class clown and I, I studied him. Alan Pearl, the idea of a guy thinking that he's funny, thinking that he's a, a great entertainer, so to speak, you know, with everybody in his social circle. But take him out of his social circle and he's a, just a really boring individual. That was a fascinating aspect of a character that I wanted to play. We started uh, developing, you know, the actual character in terms of his background and what his, you know, aspirations were and kind of what he was thinking. All those things go in the outline. Keep in time. I did a lot of laughing on set, and, and a lot of it had to do with, uh, with Chris's character, Corky. He just, he had my number. He's teaching us his dance move, and that, <laughs> that dance move, that little, I, I can't describe it, it's like a, it's like a, he does the, the quirkiest little physical move, and it always got to me and there's a bunch of us in the scene and I couldn't keep a straight face. So I work my way kind of to the rear of the group and try to hide behind the people in front of me and get to a point where I can drop to my knees and crawl off the set so that the, they'd keep the scene going and nobody would even realize I wasn't there. That happened actually a few times. In a movie like that where it's all improvised, you, you, don't, you don't really want to be the one to break up during a really funny scene because you're never going to capture that spontaneity again in an improvised movie. I mean, it only happens once. You can repeat it as best you can, but that moment's not going to be there. We learned over time not to try, to really not, not to try and laugh. Best in show. Chris had the idea. He came up and said, what about the idea of a dog show? I said, wow, you know, that's, that's fascinating. I went right to the third act when I heard the idea, and I said, I just don't know how we're going to make a, a, a dog show funny. I don't think we can do that. So that third act discussion kind of like halted the, the idea initially, and it wasn't until Chris said, what if we had Fred Willard play the color commentator? on the broadcast, and that immediately opened up the comedy for me. We could legitimately do a dog show, keep it as straight as we could do it. Fred's gonna really provide the laughs in that show. Yeah, it's sad to think, when you look at how beautiful these dogs are, to, to think that in some countries these dogs are eaten. That was miraculous in a way, because that was all Fred. You know, I can't dance, I can't, I've got two left feet. I've got two left feet. <laughs> I, I thought he was kidding. But I wasn't. Um, uh, I, I was born, uh, with two, uh, left feet. I knew generally that Jerry would be a relatively kind of nerdy type of guy married to a woman who actually was quite popular with the opposite sex, I guess, when, when she was a, a young woman. She was very popular back then. She had dozens of boyfriends. Hundreds. Hundreds. Yeah, hundreds. I did not know that. <laughs> Hundreds. We sat down in the office one day and we're going through the scene where they're talking about how they met. I said, well, I was, we met at a dance and I, you know, I wasn't a good dancer. I, I was, I was, and I was shy. I, I, I you know, I, listen, I had two left feet. I, I was that kind of guy. And I caught Chris's eye and he just was glaring at me. I knew exactly what he was glaring at, and I said, no, 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 Chris, we can't, we can't do that. Why, why not? Why, because you don't think it's funny? Why? I said, I, 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 it might be too much, it might be, I don't know, really? Two left feet, boom, we were gone, laughing, 20 minutes. His feet, I don't think I ever find myself saying this on this, but you, I think, I think yeah. you're right. Yeah, right? he's got two left feet. That is certainly a first. Go uh, get him, pal, man. 
And that was it. Had to have a shoe specially made so I could actually wear it. Bringing down the house. Boy, you are some kind of freaky. Oh, you have no idea. You got me straight tripping, boo. That came from Queen Latifah. They had lines written, kind of the hip hip hop kind of stuff that was written in the script. For the first scene, I, I had to do that. I was looking at the lines. I don't know, I felt there was something, I just felt uncomfortable. And I happened to go up to her and said, this is what I'm supposed to say in the scene. What do you think? She said, well, I wouldn't say it. What would you say? What, what would you say here? You got me straight tripping, boo. What was that again? You got me straight tripping, boo. Okay, good, good. And that's what happened. Every scene that I had, I would go to her and say, how would you say it? <laughs> you know, well, my points are out the window and I'm, I'm all, you know, taken up in the game, whatever the line was. The cool points are out the window and she's got me all twisted up in the game. She gave me those lines. I credit Queen Latifah, really. Some of those lines were, were the lines that really helped make that movie kind of what it was. I remember the straight tripping line I, I saw in some of the ads, you know, so that was all her. A mighty wind. I would love to see this uh, town in the autumn. I think Crabville in autumn would look quite magnificent. We looked at different groups, different kind of tribes, I guess. One was the Folksman, your standard three-person kind of Kingston trio, Peter, Paul, and Mary, whatever it is, uh, Chad Mitchell trio. And then you had the group that really was almost the demise of the folk music era, which is the bigger groups, the Back Porch Majority, the New Christie Minstrels, basically a terrible folk group. And the group that was left was like the, um, you know, Ian and Sylvia, and we thought, well, it's a, it's a guy and a girl, husband and wife, which these duos r were at the time. And we thought we, with that Catherine and I would, would play that. And then we were developing their songs. What songs would have been hits? Kiss at the End of the Rainbow was the, the idea that that was their, one of their first big hits. And they got to kiss at the end of the song. And it, they became the darlings of the folk music generation. There's a kiss at the end of the rainbow. More precious than a part of gold. That kiss came up as a point in their first hit song, and that really made them famous. When it came to the reunion aspect of everybody coming back together years later, and after Mitch and Mickey had a horrible divorce, a horrible kind of breaking up, and now they're coming back together for this reunion, the idea was, uh, well, I get, would they kiss at the end of the song? I mean, you know, considering. And the more we, we delved into that aspect of it, it became clear, is that the main thrust of the movie? whether they kiss at the end of that song. It was a nerve-wracking decision because I knew it wasn't funny, and can we hang a movie on something as simple as are they gonna kiss? If it doesn't play, we're dead in the water. But Chris and I both felt this was the way to go with the end of that movie, and it was something we had to risk. We just you know, went for it. Chris, as the director, tried to, sh you know, shape it story-wise as best he could, but that was it. I mean, that was, that was pretty much it. I was just kind of learning the guitar for the movie. I had kind of dabbled with the guitar years before in my folk group, but I wasn't very good and I was just a hacker. You know, I was just like cording and bad fingering. Everything had to be accurate for, the, for this movie, so I, I was taking lessons and the more I was uh, learning on the guitar, it, it gave me the ability to start maybe creating composition for these songs, like help, helping me to write. Catherine and I got together, I think maybe wrote three of the songs, and I worked on one song with Catherine, and that was it. We, we, wrote, we wrote these songs, and the, and the new Main Street Singers songs, whether it was Chris and, and Michael and Harry that wrote the songs that John Michael Higgins brilliantly arranged. We ended up writing the songs and um, winning a Grammy. 
splash. Walter Kornbluth was a, uh, yes, a scientist that uh, really didn't have a lot of friends, wasn't a popular guy, uh, opted for an opportunity to cash in on making a name for himself. He had a point to prove, which is he had a suspicion about this mermaid. Once he was told, how are you going to prove she's not a mermaid? How are you going to get her wet? You know, he was a bad guy. I always said, I mean, it was an interesting part. I didn't really love playing somebody that horrible. It was an interesting scene when I, when I was, when I had the fire hose, you know, revealing her as, you know, as the mermaid. I didn't, I didn't really love playing the villain. A lot of, a lot of people do. I, uh, you know, I, I didn't. What are you afraid of, Buck Walter? Do you think we're gonna steal the mermaid? <laughs> <laughs> what are we going to do, fold her in half and put her in a briefcase? John was, we were great friends, of course. Just such a great talent, truly funny. His persona came through on screen. That's kind of who he was. He had a great future in dramatic work that he never got a chance to, to do, but it was fun being around him for all those years, right through Second City, right through SCTV. We did like five movies together. Sweet guy. Don't go in there, man! She'll melt your face right off! I knew something like this was gonna happen. What should I do? What should I do? Huh? Oh, stop whining. Seal off the entire area. Tom, he always liked when he was off camera, he would pick up some things and just start juggling. I just thought, boy, this kid is really, you know, he's got some talent, and I loved his, his on camera persona. He was a good actor. You could see that then, you know? Ron was just in the early stages of directing, and he was kind of like Opie in a way. I mean, you know, he would get excited about things. He'd say to his director of photography, I'm wondering, you know, for this scene, if we, in the hallway, maybe if we put the camera right on top of the door, is, is that a stupid idea or is that a, no, I think it's a good idea. You, really? On top of the door? It'd be great if we could do that. Good. Good. That's how he was. It was really kind of fun to watch because I was a Ron Howard fan, no question. Grew up with him. Fun, fun, fun movie. Reluctant Traveler. I have to be honest, this is a very, very heavy mosquito thing out here right now. Yeah. So I'm not, I'm not really, you know, as relaxed as, let's say, you are. <laughs> I never wanted to be myself. On SCTV, I remember writing a soap opera called Days of the Week. Which I played a character mm, kind of like a doctor, but it was just me. You can't blame yourself, Elliot. Well, who should I blame? Bill, I'm his doctor. And I got so paranoid about how dull I thought I was on camera that I ended up writing my character out of the, of the, of the soap. I just couldn't do it. I was a little nervous in the beginning when we started last year about being myself on camera. I've never done it before. I kind of, you know, eased into it. I'm having a much better time this year. I'm quite comfortable being myself and I'm loving my interactions with everybody. It's the first time I've been on camera really just as me. Do you feel comfortable? Yes, I feel very comfortable. My own very own tartan. Huh? There are two things that make a, a good traveler. One is curiosity, and the other is, you know, you have to have a sense of adventure. Don't have them. I mean, it's just, it's not me. I don't think you can develop that. I don't know. I would say probably not. You're born with it or you're not born with it. So that's a big drawback for really loving to travel. I'm doing a lot better at it now than I than I was before. What I'm getting out of it is, you know, just just actually commit to the experience. It's better to have the experience and then tell people whether you like it or whether you don't like it rather than not having the experience at all. So that much I'm learning, just get out and do it.